Welcome to the Behavioral Sciences section of our Practice MCAT questions. In this video, I'm going to be going through questions 46 to 50. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 46, 47, 48, 49, and 50. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 46, we're asked which statement regarding memory is false. So something about memory, which one is false? Option A is saying semantic networks are important for relating various concepts. This is something which is true, so we can eliminate that answer. Semantic networks, that's when things are connected to each other. So it's not just a memory you have standing by itself, but different, different aspects of the memory are connected to each other. For example, you know, if you think about going to an amusement park, it might remind you of a time when you went that was very fun in your childhood and then you start remembering the people that you were there with. This is a semantic network, so concepts and memories are not just individually like memorized and stored in the brain, but they're connected in a type of network. And this is also important for remembering information as well. So yes, the whole semantic network thing is very important for memory. Option B is saying emotion is an important component for memory retrieval. This is also correct. A lot of memories can be tied to a certain emotion and just when you start remembering them, you start to remember those emotions as well or maybe you feel an emotion first and then the memory comes afterwards. But either way, we can see that there's a strong link between memory and emotion. Option C is saying memories are known to decay over time. Yes, this is one very well known and very important factor when it comes to memory. That's why it makes it difficult to do investigations for example because people's memory decays over time and it changes over time so it's not super reliable also think about when you wrote your last big test probably like a week afterwards a lot of that information was just gone from your brain right so if you're not actively thinking about something and also if it's not you know really emotionally tied to something then you're probably not going to remember it as well and it's going to begin to decay over time because your brain needs to have space for other things for it to focus on what's more important and finally, that leaves us with option D, which is the correct answer. Recognition relates to information, in, to identifying information without any cues, but the without part is incorrect. Recognition does rely on cues. You start seeing some cues first, and then you think, oh, wait, I kind of recognize that. And based on the cues, then you remember what it is. So recognition relies on cues. Therefore, D is a false statement, and it's the correct answer. In question 47, it says a student from a marginalized background prepares for the SAT. On test day, they fill out necessary forms, including gender, race, age, etc. During the exam, they find that they're having more trouble remembering information than in practice. They continually return to the passage for information. Ultimately, they earn a lower score. A low score. Which of the following explains this development? So someone from a marginalized background preparing for a test and then they fill out forms which have characteristics like personal characteristics that they're identifying as and then when they're actually writing the exam so during the exam they have trouble remembering information and more so than they did in practice they have to keep returning to the passage they earn a low score so we're looking for what can explain this so they did much worse now than they did in practice. That's a key thing to keep in mind. So it's not that they didn't practice properly, it's that they were doing fine before and now something has happened which has on test day caused them to score lower and kind of reduce their working memory. Option A is saying the self-fulfilling prophecy, but this doesn't fully align with what's going on here because self-fulfilling prophecy relies on cognitive thinking of something. So this is when you think about something and as you kind of internalize that thought, it begins to come true. For example, if you're playing sport, you're playing a sport like a game of basketball, for example, if you keep thinking to yourself, I'm not athletic, I'm not good at this sport, then when you go out there, you're gonna internalize this and then that's going to affect your performance because of that you're not really gonna put in that much effort and then it's going to become true because of that original thought that you had. But the key part here is that you had some something cognitive going on, you were actually thinking about something and then it led to an outcome. But what's happening in this scenario is more subconscious. And B, stereotype threat is something which explains what's going on. So this is when a member of a certain group, they 
think about and are reminded about a stereotype about their group. For example, in this case, for the marginalized background, the stereotype is that they're not that great at performing on tests. And because of that, when they're reminded by filling out these forms, in practice, they weren't thinking about this at all. They were just focusing on doing well on the test. But when they're reminded of this, then they think, okay, you know, this is the race I belong to or the, the gender or whatever group. Now, I subconsciously have this in my mind now. I've been primed that this group does not do well on tests. So maybe I might not do that well on tests. And then that kind of just gets in their head. It interrupts whenever they're trying to answer any question. We can see that it has reduced their working memory. They're having trouble recalling information from passages and overall they're doing worse. Because of this subconscious thing that they were primed of, now they have done worse. So it's not something they actually cognitively thought about, but it still affected performance. That's a stereotype threat. Option C is a fundamental attribution error and this is not really related to this scenario. That is when you look at someone else behaving in a certain way and you attribute it, attribute it to their actual personality rather than what's going on in the environment instead of being situational, whereas you wouldn't do that to yourself. So that's not what's going on here. Option D, self-efficacy. That's your belief in yourself to effectively carry out some action. But we can see that that's not what happened for the student. It's not that their self-efficacy or their, their, their self-confidence or self-efficacy was low. No, they practiced and they probably were feeling pretty confident when they came in, but it's because of something which happened specifically, which is that they filled out that form that affected their performance. In question 48, we're asked which of the following is true regarding negative reinforcement and punishment. So what is true about negative reinforcement and punishment? So negative reinforcement and negative punishment. When we're talking about, in this case, reinforcement and punishment, negative and positive, Negative refers to taking something away. Positive refers to adding something. So in both cases, we're taking something away because it's negative. And reinforcement means that you're, you're doing something in the hopes of increasing that action, the likelihood of that action happening. And punishment is when you're reducing the likelihood of that action happening. So for example, if we have mice, negative reinforcement, for example, you can continually shock them. But when they press a lever, which is what the action that you want them to do, then you take away this harmful stimulus, the shock is gone now. So it's negative because you remove something, but it's reinforcing the behavior which you want, which is that they'll keep pressing that lever or whatever else. And same thing in mice, if you want to punish them, you can take away something that was good. Like you maybe want them to do something, do some activity, and usually you give them food, but they got to accustomed to it and they're not doing the activity that you want them to. So you take away the food until they do the action that you want them to. So in this case, you're taking away something good. It's a punishment but you're still taking away something and you're doing it because you don't want them to continue an action. Maybe they're doing a certain action that you didn't want them to. That would be a better example. Okay, so maybe they're doing an action you didn't want them to and then you take away the food whenever they do that, kind of like they're grounded now, they're not getting something good. That would be a punishment. It's negative because you're taking something away. So the key thing here is, in both cases, you're taking something away, but you're getting the opposite effect, which is that reinforcement, you're taking something away, the action occurs more, Punishment, you're taking something away. That action that you want to stop occurs less. So B is the correct answer because they have opposite effects on behavior. A is incorrect. It's saying they have the same effect. No. You need to understand what reinforcement and punishment are for, and then you'll realize that it's not the same effect. It's opposite effects. C is saying they're different terms for the same phenomena. No, des describing different phenomena. And D is saying they're both ineffective. No, there has been a lot of research shown on the effectiveness of these types of these types of consequences. In question 49, it says a researcher wants to study functional fixedness in a group of subjects. Which methodological approach would be most appropriate? So they want to study this functional fixedness and which approach would be most appropriate? So you want to have a certain approach. So what is this concept that we're looking at? Functional fixedness is the tendency of individuals to only think about using objects in the way that they're normally used instead of other ways in which they could be used just because they're fixed in that mindset that, oh, this is what the intended purpose of this object is. And that can be a problem when you're trying to have some problem solving going on. So in option A, use an encephalogram on the subjects. No, this wouldn't be the most appropriate. This 
records brain waves and we can't really tell if from the brain waves if the participants are using something in the way that they've always been taught or if they're thinking outside the box. We can't do that with something measuring brain waves. Option B is saying give the subjects a pendulum problem. That's also incorrect. This is related to the stages in PHA's development theory. When, when individuals get to the formal operational stage, then they can have more abstract thinking. So in the pendulum problem, they're given a pendulum and told or they're asked which factor or variable is the most important for controlling the speed of this pendulum. And they're told it could be the length, the weight of the, the weight that the pendulum is swinging on, or the initial push that the object received. So if they were in the formal operational stage, what, what they would do is they would keep other factors constant and vary one, for example, the length, but keep the weight constant, the length of the string is what they would vary. But if children are younger than this, then they don't have that thinking yet. And they might change two variables, like they change the length of the string and the weight of the object between different trials. And then since one thing is in constant, you can't really tell which factor is more important. So this is something which arises in the formal operational stage. But once again, not really what's going on here. It's not displaying this concept. But C is Dunker's candle problem. In this individuals or participants, they're given a candle, they're given a box of matches, and they're given some tacks, and they're told to attach the candle to the wall. And, you know, they might only use the tacks. The candle is a candle. They might think the tacks are for attaching things to the wall and try to put the tacks through the candle, but the tacks aren't long enough to go through the candle and hold it into the wall. But they're not thinking about using the box of matches. They only think about that as matches. You take out, you know, a match from the matchbox, you light it from the side of the matchbox, and then you use it to light the candle but they could use that box of the match as a candle holder. They could place this on the wall, put the candle on top of it. This problem actually sees that people can think outside of the box instead of just fixating on the one function which they learned for a given object. And finally, option D is saying give the subjects a dichotic listening task. This is when you have one message being relayed to one ear and a different to the other ear, but it's not relevant for functional fixedness, so we can remove that. In question 50, it's a signal detection theory, mostly focuses on blank. So signal detection theory, this is related to isolating signals from noise. And it's not about the differences or in intensity between different signals. It's isolating signal from noise. For example, if you're in a crowded and noisy room, how are you getting rid of the noise, which is all the background noise that you're hearing, but focusing on the conversation with the person right in front of you. That would be signal detection theory. And D is the one which falls under this. The separation of important stimuli from noise. And then option A, B, and C, they're related to Weber's laws or intensity differences between signals until we determine that you know one signal is different from the other or we can initially detect a signal. But that's different from signal detection theory. So because of that, D is the correct answer. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description. And in that course, we offer lecture videos and then also videos going over questions just like we did over here. And we explain all the different answer options and why each one is correct or incorrect. Here are some reviews for the course. And that's it for this video. Make sure to subscribe here to stay up to date with what we post here. I'll see you guys in the next video.